Okay, welcome. This is our 12th ARCI video meeting. I'm Tom Zaychek, your moderator. And uh, it's hard to believe we've done 12 of these, a whole year's worth, but here we are. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for participating today. And uh, I'd like to thank all the other club members that come and join us every month. It's, it's really, truly a nationwide thing, so thank you. And I'd also like to also put out a, a request to everyone to be a presenter. These, these uh, meetings happen just about every month. And uh, so we'll put out a poll later after the presentations to uh, poll your interest in being a presenter. So expect that poll later on. Our next meeting is July 17th. And if you have any feedback or ideas, uh, there's our email address. And uh, as you probably noticed, a uh, little notice comes up that we are recording these meetings and they're put on YouTube on our uh, YouTube site. Uh, Matt will now give you a little brief intro on what that means that we're on YouTube. Okay, so I'm pretty sure everybody knows this, but uh, remember we're on YouTube, so don't show or say anything that you wouldn't want to say in front of the world. Because we know that the world is watching our YouTube channel, all 95 subscribers. <laughs> um, use the chat uh, for things that you want to keep confidential. And the main thing to be aware of is that YouTube is very persnickety about uh, copyrighted music. So be careful not to have music playing in the background. And of course, stay muted so that we don't interrupt others. I'm going to uh, launch a poll in just a second here to see who's interested in doing show and tell. Well, we have a low turnout of show and tellers today. <laughs> Good to know for planning. Okay, so uh, here's our agenda for today. And we've got four great presentations lined up. And <clears throat> these presentations are really special. They, they come from guys that have done a lot of research and a lot of radio restoration and have got great collections. And this is something that uh, our video participants have an in interest in because we polled them a few months ago and history of radio companies and restorations and looking at collections were at the top of the list in terms of what you viewers are interested in. So today we've got a, a lineup that kind of fits that bill really nicely. So we'll um, start into that first with Robert Lozier, who's going to do his presentation on the Mills Radio Corporation. Robert has done uh, many presentations and many for us already. So uh, we're in for a special treat. So here we go. I'll turn it over to, to Roger. As usual, I've recorded a uh, audio track there and hopefully you see my uh, green screen there, full screen. And uh, th so this is a video and it lasts about uh, 11 minutes and uh, describing a, uh, a rare set uh, and I go into why it may be rare. So here goes. Vintage radio item with little known facts or lore. 1920s American made broadcast receiver. The Mills Radio Corporation National made in Raleigh, North Carolina. This Mills Radio Corporation, Raleigh, North Carolina outfit must date from late 1923 to maybe 1924. It seems to be only the fifth known surviving branded made in North Carolina broadcast band radio of the 1920s. It was found by a picker at a yard sale in Wellington, North Carolina in October 2019. He could offer no background on the set. A search of microfilmed Raleigh newspapers seems to indicate that at that time, the area newspapers must have been deliberately boycotting any news 
of the radio broadcast industry or taking any advertising mentioning radios for sale, regarding them as competition. More about this later. As found, the cabinet top, made of typical lumber core plywood of the day, had considerable failure of the laminate glue. At least all the layers were there for the top. The bottom plywood panel of the same type of material was missing half of the bottom veneer ply, and it too exhibited failed laminate glue, but not as severely. The heavily mildewed Acme audio transformer, I was sure, would be open circuit, but both audios tested good and cleaned beautifully. The external connections made through the back of the cabinet revealed them to be a very poorly thought out arrangement. I have no documentation on the radio, so I simply traced and photographed the circuit to yield this schematic. The antenna is connected to a parallel resonant circuit that is connected to a series resonant circuit. Note that the small variable capacitor has an additional gimmick capacitor to bring tuning into range. The output of the first tube is connected to two stages of broadband RF amplification using seldom seen plug-in radio instrument company iron core transformers. These are specified for use over a wavelength range of 220 to 550 meters. That's 540 to 1360 kilohertz. This circuit would not have been in violation of the regenerative radio patents controlled by the Radio Corporation of America. This tuning arrangement would provide poor selectivity even by standards existing in 1925, but at the time that this radio was designed, there were only two official frequencies for all of broadcasting. At this time, it was unusual to have a mix of 3-volt and 5-volt filament vacuum tubes. How were the UV-199s protected from overvoltage? A solution I cannot recall seeing before. Simply drill a hole through the rheostat body and string a loop of heavy iron wire around the resistance element big enough to stop the rheostat wiper from rotating further. The rheostat for the two audio amplifier tubes have dual resistance elements in series to properly regulate current to one amp or the newer one quarter amp tubes such as the UV-201A. The radio needed to be totally disassembled. The builder had elected to place sheets of 1 16th inch thick red rubber gasket material under the tube sockets and the sockets for the RF transformers. Over the years, it had partially liquefied, trapping all sorts of gunk in the process and was very difficult to remove without damage to the pine plank baseboard. It is a mystery to me as to why this was done. There is no circuitry needing insulation from the shellacked pine board, the rubber gasket material being dense and only 1 16th inch thick was not going to provide any vibration dampening of the tube internal elements to prevent microphonic feedback known as tube howl. And being so thin, it likely would not significantly minimize any cracking of the Bakelite moldings should the pine plank expand or contract ranges. The sulfur content of the gasket rubber did a number on these tube contacts. Even though the contacts looked terrible, a long zap in the ultrasonic cleaner and buffing with a clockmaker's fine fiberglass scratch brush had them looking quite good. So, the careful cleaning had the interior looking just fine. However, as I rewired the circuit, I realized that there is a 1000 picofarad capacitor that is likely installed in the wrong location. 
I checked the close-up pictures taken before disassembly, and they clearly show the original wiring of this capacitor. The capacitor is wired across the first audio secondary winding. I think it should be wired from the primary plate lead of that transformer to B- minus to give the RF at the detector plate circuit a path to ground. In either case, the radio probably worked good enough. With the three large dials on the front panel, most collectors would pass this set by, thinking it was just another boring three-dial TRF. Not many would have noted that it was marked Made in North Carolina and know that there were very few makers in the state. If they had bothered to lift the lid, it would have instantly become far more interesting with its tube mix and variometer, an admonition for us all to not take things for granted. Three of the five tubes found with the set bear testing labels of the Victor Furniture Company in Morganton, North Carolina. They are dated December 30, 1927. So even though this was no radio for use in nighttime DX fun, it could still probably pick up the station in Asheville or Charlotte, 50 and 75 miles away. So here is the radio ready for its portrait. Note that the grain orientation on the top is from front to back, and the same is true of the base. I presume that a local cabinet shop was simply making do with odds and ends. There is a routed channel for the bottom of the hard rubber panel to rest in that shows signs that it was made with hand tools. The grained panel appears to be like that of the American Hard Rubber Company Radeon brand material and is professionally engraved and filled with gold lacquer stick. AHR did have an engraving service. I think that this radio may have been a prototype or one of just a very few made. Why is that? The largest Raleigh city paper of the 1920s, the News and Observer, is well documented to have been heavily associated with the forces of white supremacy, so maybe they also had no desire to have broadcasting importing outside ideas. This paper was highly influential in the eastern part of the state, and none of the other papers in the area seemed to dare deviate from the N&O editorial positions. The commentary shown above is indeed shocking to my sensibilities. To quote from Daniel's own writings, the News and Observer was relied upon to carry the democratic message and to be the militant voice of white supremacy, and it did not fail in what was expected, sometimes going to extremes in its partisanship. Daniels believed that the greatest folly and crime in U.S. history was granting blacks the right to vote. The boycotting of broadcast radio was not observed in other areas of the state. Distinctly, the opposite position was exhibited by owners of the Asheville, North Carolina, Citizens newspaper. In 1922, on the third floor of the Citizen building, rooms were let to a Mr. Rambo, who was building radios sold under the brand name of high-grade wireless apparatus company, and obtained a license to operate a tiny broadcast station, WFAJ. The Citizen Paper had numbers of radio articles and small advertisements for radio parts and sales from 1922 onward. The same could be said for Charlotte major newspapers. Of course, later in the decade, the News and Observer would have to relent on radio boycott. There was just too much money to be made on advertising once major radio manufacturers started subsidizing local retailer campaigns. But for the Mills Radio Corporation, the inability to advertise in local newspapers and the fact that they may have tried to introduce their radio with its limited selectivity just at the time when broadcast frequency allotments were greatly increased likely spelled an end to their dreams.
All right, so there you go. That's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Well, thank you. Thank you, Robert. That was a, a very fascinating presentation. Do we have any questions for Robert? Well, I'd like to say that the amount of research and restoration you've done there is just excellent and stellar. Uh, the, just the fact that you could determine where all those com components came from and the the way that circuit was put together uh, has really shows some uh, some really deep digging and historical research. That's uh, quite impressive. Yeah, uh, the trying to find the backstory to any of these things. You know, why do they exist? Yeah, uh, that's the that's the fascinating part. So uh, I'll keep trying. Yeah, probably not a lot of those radios around. So yeah, any other questions? For Robert, if not, I, I'm curious if there people are aware of other instances where newspapers were trying to suppress radio. I mean, regardless of the politics of it, just the competition of it. Uh, there, I do remember, but I can't cite a specific issue. But in uh, magazines like uh, Radio Broadcast. Uh, um, uh, popular radio and so forth. There were articles in the 1920 to 1924 vintage where they're debating how should um, uh, radio be financed, uh, commercial radio be financed. And was it to be something to be embraced or uh, by newspapers or uh, considered to be a competition for revenue. So uh, having made that statement, somebody says, well, show me the article. Well, today I can't show you that, but I've, I know over the years that, uh, that, that I've, I've read many editorials uh, that reinforce that statement. Interesting, thank you. I think that he made a phenomenal <laughs> description of uh, the Mills Company and uh, added to the history of our radio uh, industry. Good job. Thank you. Great, great. Okay, so now our next presenter is uh, Dale Boyce, and this is part two of his Briggs and Stratton uh, history. And last month he did the Crystal Radio history of Briggs and Stratton. And this month, he's going to talk about their battery eliminator business. And he's done an excellent job in digging into the details of uh, how they got started in the business and all the details around that market. So with that being said, I'll turn it over to Dale. Well, I thank you for that nice introduction. And yeah, this is part two of Briggs and Stratton. We get into their battery eliminators and and the other stuff that I found will have to wait for a, a presentation in the future. And they made other stuff that is definitely radio related, radio products. And so here's, a, here's the Radio A. Uh, they uh, were eliminating, replacing an A battery. Uh, they made a metal box like this for the Rady A and the Rady B and, the, uh, and an A and B combined one. We'll see more pictures later. So before the Racy radios that most of us grew up with, there were battery radios. Most of them required a large wet cell type battery, like a car battery, heavy due to the lead plate construction, full of nasty battery acid, they discharged while the radio was on to make the radio run. They were difficult to wrestle around for charging. Dealers and radio service stations would recharge batteries for a fee. A good description that I found is uh, from the Radio Collector's Directory and Price Guide by Grinder and Fathenauer. Uh, at least two types of battery were required. Rechargeable A, storage battery. That's the wet cell used to supply low voltage, high current, for the two filaments, uh, a non-rechargeable B battery comprised of small dry cells wired together 
in blocks of 15 to 30 was used to supply the higher voltage, low current requirements for the detector and amplifier circuits. And according to their comments, the family usually recharged its A battery once a week. About every third time the A battery was recharged, the B battery had to be discarded, uh, replaced. So that was expensive. Most people did not have a way to recharge their radio A batteries. And those didn't last a long time. The smaller C batteries uh, for connection to bias the grid element were also required. Battery acid in a house with adults, children, pets, furniture, carpet, relatives, visitors, uh, was a recipe for problems. Uh, most everyone wanted to help tune or adjust the radio and, and spills of battery acid were not uncommon. No one wanted to spill battery acid in their vehicle going to or from a charging station. So what are battery eliminators? They were manufactured in the mid to late 20s and some later on. They connect by cord and plug into 110 volt alternating current a receptacle or with adapter to a screw in a 110 volt light bulb socket. They produce non-fluctuating direct current output to operate the 1920s battery powered radios, A, B, and C circuits. One and a half to seven and a half volts for A, 22 and a half to 450 volts for the B, zero to negative 50 for the C. Battery eliminators usually include a transformer, rectifier, filter, and an output control. The rectifier section uh, might include electrolytic cells, crystals, vacuum tubes with filaments, vacuum tubes without filaments, and or dry rectifiers. The unspoken word is that some battery eliminators have internal wet cell A batteries that needed to be maintained and charged. So they were not quite eliminated. Here's an example of some radio batteries. The uh, B battery, the rail back here is, is just B. That's a heavy duty one. The A and B battery also from Rayovac was a, did the one and a half volt A and the multi-volt B. Uh, on top, we got a couple little C batteries, the Rayovac versions. This is a larger C battery. And over on the right side, it's a coast to coast store, wet cell, A battery. It uh, survived, but it was uh, frozen during, uh, during its time in an outdoor storage facility. I found very little about the uh, battery chargers. Uh, a source that has some information, the book series Radio Manufacturers of the 1920s by the late Alan Douglas has general history and development of radios as well as details about 70 of the largest radio manufacturers. Briggs and Stratton is briefly mentioned in the Tri-City chapter because Tri-City had, uh, had the license, one of the 17 or 20 licensees, depending on which source you look at. If you don't have these books, I recommend you consider them. I have a few Basco battery eliminator artifacts that survived the World War II scrap metal drives, but I think that's where most of them went. Sales tells some of the story. This data is from radio retailing in March, 1928. B battery units grew from 10,000 units in 1924 up to 500,000 units in 27 dropped back down to 400,000 units in 28. National sales of A and A plus B battery units was 550,000 in 1928. I could not find data for prior to 1928. So it's logical to understand how a manufacturer with technical design staff, skilled workers and significant factory, the Basco East plant in Milwaukee could get product into this market. National sales, all the money, A, B, and C power units, uh, the $7 million sales in 23, over 25 million in 24, 30 million in 25, 55 million in 1926, according to radio retailing. 
I do not know what, if any, share of these markets for Basco. The book Legends of Briggs and Stratton indicates on page 27 that net sales of Basco radio equipment averaged more than $100,000 a year between 1922 and 1929. Basco introduced radio power units, what they called their illuminators, into the market in 1927 and 28. By that time, some of the big manufacturers had already left the market. Here's the B power unit showing the, the connections on the uh, outside and the adjustment knob. Advertising, as you'll see in the ads, Basco did not hesitate to take out large newspaper and magazine ads. They produced bold signs for their dealers to display. In addition, you'll find a little bit of their uh, advertising on radiomuseum.org website and uh, information as well as, as uh, images. Uh, this is part of the display I had at Radio Fest a few years ago. There's an example of their uh, sign that would have been used in a dealer's window. And some of the, uh, there's a, a B power unit and some of the other articles that I had on display for that, that Radio Fest. 1927 is generally the year referenced when AC radios appeared in radio magazines and expositions, trade shows, newspapers, and people could buy them. The, by 1927, AC tubes had been developed and incorporated into radios. This meant that residential customers who lived in towns and cities which had AC power and who could afford to purchase new AC radios could get rid of their old battery radio and that's often messy and high maintenance batteries, or they could purchase battery eliminators, which operated on AC power, to power their battery radios. They were also popular among amateur radio operators and home built radio enthusiasts. The era of AC radio tubes, these AC radio tubes were a bridge for the battery radio owner to modify the radio to use AC power without having to replace the valuable radio and accessories. The new AC tubes with names like Cardon, Sovereign, Kellogg, McCullough, Marathon, Sonatron, Spartan, Van Horn, National Union, and others were available from radio stores and catalogs. They are collectible and there's a lot of other manufacturers that made them. These new tubes were distinctive in that the filament connections were generally extended out of the top or out of the sides instead of extending down from the bottom of the base. While most had six connectors, two at the top and four in the base, they fit into the four pin base tube sockets of the battery sets. On most of these, one of the pins in the tube wasn't connected to anything. Separate wiring harnesses or connectors brought power to the two upper connections. These are an example of some of the AC radio tubes with the top connection. National Union 401. The second one is a bootleg knockoff uh, 401. There were lots of knockoff manufacturers. They had the sockets, they had the tube manufacturing ability. They just didn't bother to get the license. The third one over is McCullough, which was one of the first, and Kellogg on the our right hand side, which is a can be kind of a standard. Here's a Cardin Spartan, their 401 version, Van Horn 5VC with four uh, screw terminals on the shoulder, top of the base, and then Sonatron on the right side with again four screw terminals at the, on the shoulder. They also had the pins coming out of the bottom of the tube, so they would fit into the tube sockets. Here's Marathon's offering. An AC is 608, 608A and a 608B. They kept improving their uh, tubes. And then the last slide of the tubes, the Sovereign, they were the first one that came out. They have a top hat type construction with screw terminals. And they've got kind of a square shouldered tube shape 
The middle one, again, is the standard Kellogg 401, the tapered tube with two top connections. And on the right side is a 403 uh, square shoulder, similar to the Sovereign. As I say, there were a lot of other ones that made it too, made variations of these. 1927 is when the Milwaukee newspaper advertisements uh, started showing the Basco radio power units. Uh, they sold them, they, the list of dealers is included in the newspaper articles and advertisements. Radio shops, hardware stores, uh, furniture stores, department stores, you name it, they were selling radio. Uh, back in the 1980s, Joe Pavick, who some of you knew, uh, he's gone now, but he was a radio collector and he founded the Pavick Museum of Wonderful Wireless, St. Louis Park, Minnesota. He related to me that when he was on a road trip in the upper Midwest selling automotive paints and parts and looking for radios, he often found radios in funeral homes since they displayed the latest furniture, including radios at that time, mostly console radios. He found radios wherever they were. Here's a, a Milwaukee newspaper advertisement from uh, November, 1927 with the whole family of Briggs and Stratton radio power units. Here's a flyer I got from one of the old timers who worked at Briggs and Stratton. Uh, he restored one of their uh, power units that was in their museum. Here's another radio advertisement rearranged a bit, but on the right, you'll see a partial list of some of the dealers. They showed dealers in basically Wisconsin and Upper Michigan, but they had them all over the country. Uh, radio News has a product review in 1927. It includes these A and B socket power units. Uh, Milwaukee Papers, as I said, had advertisements. October, November, 1927. These and other radio ads from 1927 reference the use of the Raytheon rectifying cartridge. Other ads refer to the use of Raytheon tubes. The Raytheon rectifying cartridge is discussed by the late Alan Douglas in the vacuum tube section of the Old Timers Bulletin, volume 25, March 85. That's the AWA journal. The article describes the development of the cartridge and it names Briggs and Stratton as one of the USA companies who designed equipment around it. It indicates that Raytheon introduced the rectifier cartridge in June of 27 and discontinued it in October 27 due to violent, exploding, end of life operating events. I don't know how long it took Raytheon to notify all their customers, but certainly Briggs and Stratton did redesign their, their, their power units. This is a copy of the uh, AWA article, again, uh, March, 1985. It shows this kind of unique looking rectifier cartridge. I don't recall ever having seen one, but they were only on the market a few months, except for people like Hudson Ross, who still showed them in their 1928 list of Raytheon rectifier products. Uh, I have three of the Radia units. Uh, none of them have this rectifier cartridge. Literature is conflicting. And newspaper ads that I have found all indicate rectifying cartridges. So when I look in these units, uh, they don't have the cartridge, but these unrestored A units both have the uh, the Tungar type rectifiers. The one on the uh, middle of the page here has the remnants of the uh, wet cell A battery, which is gone in the uh, one on the right side. And I have not restored these yet, but they are projects waiting to be done. I don't have a schematic for them. I have not seen a wiring diagram for them. The sales literature that I have a copy of for the Radi-A uh, 
is interesting in that it does show the Tungar type rectifier, not the cartridge. Well, at some point they made the change. These slides are basically a copy of what's in the newspapers. There's a B unit close up with a the cord coming out of the middle of the bottom. There's another one, the, the middle bottom hole is, it was changed out and the cord's coming out of lower left. Also missing as part of the, uh, the Bradley controller. So these were modified. I don't know if it was a factory mod or, or an owner mod. This is a view inside the one that has the cord coming out the center. It's rotated 90 degrees. There you see the, the Bradley resistor. This is a tube selector knob where the three different types of tubes it was designed for. Output, excuse me, transformer. And then over on the end is the, in this case, a 112 uh, tube. It's got, it's got a tip top, so it's uh, one of the earlier ones. These are more text basically copied from the newspaper articles. Uh, seeing the A and B next to each other, the B is slightly smaller. Here's our little Basco advertising guy again. And this is a, a picture of the inside. And they show this horizontal cylindrical Rayleigh rectifying element. Uh, this brochure is not dated, but I would date it to the 1928 era. And certainly after the, or I mean 1927, because it's prior to their use of the, of the Tungar. Uh, there were a lot of battery eliminator folks, uh, Briggs and Stratton here in Milwaukee. Global Electric also, Racine had Webster, lots of companies from Chicago. Uh, Hudson Ross catalog for 28, I found more than 90 different battery eliminators that were still on the market. And if you look at 1930s catalogs, you'll find more of them. Here we've got what are Kent products on the left, uh, Crosley with the uh, slope top. And the one on the right is All American Mohawk, uh, Illinois product. Here's the Global Electric from Milwaukee. B power. Now, since cities and towns were wired for AC power long before most rural areas of the country, battery eliminators were initially used more extensively in the urban areas. In the rural areas, residents depended on their crystal and battery powered radios, <coughs> excuse me, for years after their urban counterparts. It was not until 1935 that the Rural Electrification Administration, REA, was created by President FDR through Executive Order 7037. My father farmed in Southern Minnesota. He told me they did not get REA AC power till 1939. Prior to 1939, they were off the grid and they knew it. They used a windmill for pumping water after REA came, they kept the windmill. Uh, they wired up a couple buildings, but the, the house and the barn, but not all the buildings. Uh, they had a few circuits in the house. They kept the kerosene lamps, even after they got some lighting. Washing machines were typically powered by small gas engines uh, through the twenties. And of course they had to be ventilated. Belt driven farm machinery had uh, gas engines or hit or miss engines like Fairmont made a, a few miles away from where they were. And wood burning cooking ranges and trash burgers and kitchens were commonplace for many years. Grandma had one in 1982 yet. Depression time this was. They farmed with horses and mules. Many could not afford tractors or, or steam engines. He told me that after a six mile drive to town, six miles back, horse and wagon on gravel roads to deliver half of a butcher, purebred Berkshire hog, 100, 110 pounds. He told me he was able to collect $6. The delivery took the whole day. 
So even with an RC, REA loan and a, a new battery, a new AC powered radio was not a very high priority plans. They relied on the old Irma battery radio and, and uh, they had a little Utah speaker and when the fragile Bakelite shell of the speaker broke, it was replaced with an upside down clay flower pot of the same size. It had told me it worked just fine. The investment in the Erla radio and the batteries and speaker was probably as much as a car. Uh, they had a battery charger that could run off a 32 volt DC farm plant or a windmill generator plant, but those were not cheap. Windmill generator plants were available from companies like Zenith and Montgomery Wards and others. Uh, I went back there often. Uh, yeah, I spent my first six years on that farm. Then my parents moved. We were a long ways away. This tells more of my family story. But time is running running out. So after RAA wired the countryside, the telephone arrived with phone wires mounted on the tele on the power poles. So where are they called telephone poles? Well, in some cases the phone company had their own telephone poles. Now we're waiting for fiber optic or teleportation system cabling. I bring you greetings from Fern the Fawn and the Doe. Fern showed up on May 25th. Just a couple of days ago, cluck cluck, a turkey hen and her six chicks arrived. They were scurrying through the front yard. And on June 3rd, Briggs and Stratton, the twin fawns were showed up at our place. Here they are having lunch. Is it lunchtime yet? <laughs> well, I, I thank you to everybody who helped with this and over the years who's helped with my collection. With that, I'll ask for questions and stop the presentation. When it comes up on YouTube, you'll be able to go in and uh, read some of those images uh, more thoroughly if you're interested. Well, well thank you so much, <clears throat> Dale. That was an excellent presentation and you, you really covered some fascinating stuff. And, and you know, I, I'm not a big collector of 1920s era radios and I learned a hell of a lot about that whole transition from uh, DC to AC right there. That, that was awesome. Thank you very much. Well, thank Any you. Your questions. Hi, I have one. Yes, and on one of the uh, AC tubes, there were four connections on the top. Yeah. If this was this just for, I'm assuming, um, you know, an isolated heater, but for a, to power it from I mean, six volt AC. But why would there be four connections? Uh, that's a good question, and I need to go back to a tube manual to look that up. Robert yeah. could probably tell us he's probably got some of those. Well, what I what I can tell you is that uh, I forgot to ask you why, because I don't know the answer either. Uh, I'll I'll look it up in the uh, in the one of the two books. Uh, well, I, I do have one comment: is that on some of those that. Uh, tubes that have a skirt with four terminations, it's to allow to put a C bias battery in and it's not a AC uh, tube. Oh, it's, okay. And uh, so that could possibly uh, be the issue there is that it, it not a, it's not really a, an AC tube. Um, okay. And I invite you to prove me otherwise. <laughs> After I after I go on hold and, and leave the screen here, I'll uh, I'll check a couple of tube books and see what I can find out. Maybe I can let you know before the end of this Zoom meeting. Okay. Any other questions for Dale? Dale, if you could stop sharing, we'll we'll get ready to do our next presentation, okay. which uh, Greg Van Beek is going to do part two of his presentation. This one's a video presentation because this second part of his collection is uh, kind of scattered around the house and it would have taken a long time to 
to do it live. So he's made a video for us. So take it away, Greg. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Uh, exactly. I had about 50 radios last month. I showed you in the basement, which I did a virtual tour on. Now these are scattered throughout the house. There's another roughly 50 and I edited together a little bit of video of it. And I had them all turned on just so you could see the dials that up and inadvertently uh, in a few cases some music did leak through for a few seconds but I think it's only less than 10 seconds so I don't think the copyright police will, will get on the uh, case about it but nonetheless uh, let me try sharing the screen and see if we can get this rolling all right let's... okay I'll go full screen how does that look Looks good. Okay, I'll press play and we'll go on for about 16 minutes. This is a 1936 General Electric model E101 color rattle. As the uh, dial stays red in between stations, when you get to a strong station, Green. Start your weekday mornings with Rick Jensen right here on 101. One year only novelty. <laughs> 39 General Electric little compact radio phone combo. Kind of unique because of the uh, lid is flat and the tone arm sits flat under here too what you have to do when you want to play the phonograph you lift up on the tone arm that kills the rf section leaving you just the amplifier so you move the tone arm over to the record play the record when you're done push it back down and you can listen to the radio again this is a 1938 zenith walton 12 tube set in a reproduction cabinet. Here we have two radios from 1935. Coco Butterfly. And Silver Tone Model 1954. Nineteen thirty-four Grunau model five fifty cigar box, and here's a nineteen thirty-nine Zenith pancake. This is a nineteen thirty-six Stuart Warner cube. Has a big bold dial and an eye tube. Nineteen thirty-nine Silver Tone model sixty-one twenty. Has an eye tube. 1938 Zenith, model 6S229. This had a full finish originally, and unfortunately, in this example, it was sanded off. So I recreated it as best I could using vinyl wood grain wrap. This is 1946 Bendix, model 526A. They made several types of these. One was a wood cabinet one. The other one was a Catalan, which you'll see a little bit later. 1936 RCA 6T2, 6 tube tombstone. Has a nice uh, glass dial that's lit on the sides. Original grill cloth. This is a 1939 Airline on a 93BR-715A. It has a unique dial. It's kind of like a slot machine. It's used the eye tube. It's very short. It plugs in the front of the chassis. 1950 Arvin Hopalong Cassidy, model 441T. And my little orphan annual old teen shakeup mug right next to it. And this is a metal advertisement for that very radio. It cost $16.95 in 1950. 1948 Philco, model 48230, the flying wedge. 
And over here, we have a 1939 Motorola Model 51A, which was, which some people say resembled the from the 1930s. 1946 Philco, Model 461, otherwise known as the Bing Crosby Special. Here's an original advertisement featuring Bing playing that very record player. This is a 1942 Philco, well, 42 KR5. It was one of those radios that was it sold as an accessory for a Philco refrigerator that sat on top of the refrigerator. This one features a clock. The clock is not a timer, it's just a timepiece. And sitting next to it, kind of radio related, this is a 1946 can of Johnson's Wax featuring radios Fibber McGee and Molly. 1937 airline movie dial model 62-309 and sort of a movie palace looking dial very art deco and a very cool dial that's what attracted me to this radio it has eight uh, station preset buttons and a chrome chassis of course as most of the higher end uh, airline radios did 1946 Fada Temple Catalan Radio Model 652. And as with most most Catalans, depending on where the uh, dial light appears, it'll actually glow through the top of the radio, which is why you don't want to leave these things play for very long because the heat could definitely damage the Catalan material. 1946 Bendix Catalan Model 526C, C being for Catalan. With a beautiful marble finish. And the Catlin is sitting on top of a 1936 Silver Tone, actually 1937 Silver Tone model 4588. This is the top of the line 13 tube Silver Tone featuring the flash tuning dial. Really has a fantastic sound. This is almost like a Philco High Fidelity set. And just a brief demo of the uh, flash tuning feature. This one features a relay, which is like a set of contact points, like you'd find in a, in a car and a distributor. And the very first models used this, and they were rather troublesome. They make a lot of racket, a lot of noise. But basically what it does, as you tune through the, through the dial, it's quiet between stations. And once you get to a station, it'll click. The light will come on, and the station will come in. A little bit further, trying to get rid of the glare here. Here's another flash. The station would come in. I'm using a tunable loop antenna so the stations aren't really coming in unless I tune the antenna at the same time, but this gives you an idea how the flash tuning feature works. It has a very nice dial, one of the prettiest dials I think out there at that time. There's a 1935 Westinghouse model WR22 uses an S.J. Emerson chassis. This is all original finish, has a beautiful inlay stripe on it. It's the original grill cloth. Very nice little five tube tombstone. And the very Art Deco 1935 Philco model 16. 11 tube tabletop monster, which just screams Art Deco. There's the shadow meter, and make work here. This is a 1937 Spartan, model 987 council, very tall council, and it features one of the mirrored chrome dials probably one of the nicest dials of any radio if i turn it on you'll be able to see uh, let me just kill the lights first so you can get a better view of it okay this should give you the full effect just a beautiful dial and it features a little window down below 
with a rotary dial where you can scroll through to find your local stations, what the call letters are and what the frequency is. Very impressive looking dial. This is a very rare 1937 Zenith model 8S137 in a Zephyr cabin. It was an export model that uh, I think originated in Mexico. Most of them were from down there. They featured a step transformer with a, a port in the back where you could plug into about three or four different voltages for around the globe. The uh, stateside Zephyr models were a six tube chassis. This one is the eight tube chassis featuring the target tuning. And I got this set from the original owner, believe it or not. Finishes all original, came with the original owners. Now this is one of the crown jewels of my collection. Has his little radio sitting on top of it. With Charlie McCarthy sitting next to an NBC microphone from the late 1930s, early 40s. This I got from Chicago radio legend Chuck Shaden. The uh, microphone flag is original, but the microphone itself is a wood mock up. It's not an actual microphone, it's a block of wood that made to look like a microphone. You can't touch one of these for under $2,000 and didn't want to invest $2,000 in a static piece like this. So that's sort of a poor man's RCA microphone. Charlie McCarthy is a 1938 Majestic. It's a Model 1. I think they had a Model 1A. It might have been a different color. This 7-2-1942 Zenith Model 7S633 was purchased new by my great-grandparents. And I received it in the very early 80s, so I'm actually the well, the third owner because my grandparents got it, got it after my great-grandparents passed away. So this has been the family since new. So this is a little 1947 Coronado Jewel, model 43-8160. Kind of unique that the dial is right in front of the speaker. A very compact cabinet. I think it's only about four or five tubes. And this is my collection of white Bakelite uh, plastic cabinet radios. Down here we have a 1941 Coronado model C640. I believe these also were more famous as a Belmont. I think they're known as the Rabbit. Some of the other ones are the Crosley dashboard radios. This is a 1950 model 10-135. They had a different number for each color. They came in several different colors. This is a 1953 model E15. And this is a 1951 model 11-120U. Features a, a clock with a timer. You could plug in your coffee pot on the side of the radio and it would start it up in the morning. Be have the coffee ready to go when you got up. This is a 1946 Zenith model 60015. Has a brass inlay in the middle and a little handle on top. And over here, this is a 1949 Philco, model 49-501, the Boomerang. Here we have a couple of Atwater Kents. On the left is a 1931, model 82. And on the right is a 1934, model 206. Couple more cathedrals on the left is a 1955 Philco model 89D. And on the right is a 1933 RCA model 121. Here we have a 1948 Arvin Midget model 442, little four tube set. And next to it, we have a 1940 Philco model PT-61 in the jewel case. This is just a regular five tube All-American five transit tone but in a very elaborate wooden cabinet. This is a 1940 Coronado model 636. I believe Belmont also made the exact same radio. Now this is a 1947 Fada, model 740. This I actually gifted to my father one year for Christmas because when he was growing up, he had one just like this in his dad's basement workshop. He used to listen to the 
60s rock tunes on. This is another 1938 Zenith Walton set. This is a 9S232. And this cabinet was not made by Kenny Richmond. This cabinet was made by my dad. He doesn't have a wood shop. He's just got simple hand tools, but he certainly did an amazing job of recreating the cabinet to the original dimensions. Certainly looks the part. This is a 1938 Zenith model 7S258. But there's something a little different about it. As you'll see, it has motorized tuning. And this radio initially was a seven tube chassis that didn't have motorized tuning. So what I did, I substituted a 12S shutter dial chassis and matching speaker from a 12 tube 1938 Zenith chair side. So I created a console out of a chair side. Hiding in the darkness is this 1939 Airline Model 93WG-601. Another one that uses sort of a spool dial, looks like a slot machine. Has an eye tube and push button presets. And this is a 1937 Detrola Model 139E. It's a cube radio. These came in several different cabinet designs. A lot of them had the speaker alongside the dial. This one has a speaker on the side. Nice brass discussion and eye tube. Little bullet knobs. There you can see part of the speaker. And that's it. That's great, Greg. That was an awesome collection, both parts one and part two, but uh, you've got some really fine radios in your collection. I'm also impressed by all the family history that ties into those. And the fact that your dad made a cabinet by hand, a Walton cabinet, that's that's pretty impressive. And it's a great story. I was impressed too when he got done with that. I have one question. Sure. Uh, your second set that you showed was a little General Electric with a phonograph in the top of it. Yeah. And one thing that popped into my head is that uh, I think somebody remarked that that was the first uh, uh, phonograph to have a crystal pickup in it. And uh, hmm. have you ever heard that or anybody else can confirm that 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 was true. I think that dates from 1937, is it? Uh, I, I think it was 39. Um, it, it just had a standard uh, cartridge, and I didn't uh, notice anything out of the ordinary with it. Uh, obviously, it was dead. I put one of those P51s in it. Um, but no, I, that I couldn't tell you. <laughs> OK. Any other questions for Greg today? Uh, just a comment. Uh, looks really good, Greg, and, and compliments to uh, you and your dad for restoring those and for his handiwork. Was was he the guy that made the microphone as well? He did. Yeah, that's got some metal mesh around the frame of it. it's actually a wood block in there, and it looks just like like the real thing. I yeah, found the mesh. What, what, what a craftsman! What a craftsman! Well, thank you. And and obviously, some of those radios came from your collection as well, and I'm. <laughs> Happy to have them, and I want to say you did a fantastic presentation as well. You really enjoyed that, Briggs and Stratton. Oh, thank sure. you. Very nice, very nice presentation. Enjoyed it. Thank you, Charlie. Well, okay. Thank you, Greg, for taking the time to put all that together and show us that. That that was very special. And um, with that being said, moving along here our fourth and last presentation today is Tom Klenschmidt, who has been doing a, a series on radio preservation. And this is part six. And we're all anxious to see what part six is all about, Tom. All righty. Well, we'll get going here then. So um, 
Yeah, number six here. And again, same uh, FADA radio. Won't go through all the details because most of you have seen this. And for those that haven't, you can go look at the stuff on our YouTube channel. Um, this is uh, kind of my approach to things. Doesn't mean it's the only way to go. And uh, remember that uh, we're trying to do Radio 101 here. So for people that are well experienced, uh, you know, feel free to chime in. Uh, so my theme this time is to make the radio robust. As you know, last time we demonstrated that it worked, uh, but now it's time to make sure it's safe and that it's going to stay working. So we're going to start out with the wiring. So two issues. One is over here, you can see that the cord has had a cut in it, which it, it had when I got it. And it had a non-polarized plug. Now, in, in reality, if the cord was good with a non-polarized plug, I would have left it. But since we haven't replaced the cord anyway, and by the way, it was also full of paint and all kinds of, you know, it just looked awful. And it's a replacement plug, at least. It's one of those, those puncture type jobs that you uh, slide together. So uh, we're going to go to a polarized plug. We'll talk about that in a second here. As a reminder, on all American five sets that have no transformer, the switch is on the ground side of the chassis. And the reason for that is to keep the AC noise under control. But that means if you have a non-polarized plug like this, you can make the chassis sit at 120 volts, which not so great. On the new modern plugs we get on all of our appliances and things we buy today, they have a wide tang and a narrow tang and the wide tang goes to neutral and uh, in, in, uh, neutral is at zero volts. That's uh, how it'll get wired in. Uh, some of you may remember reading manuals back in the day where it said if your radio hummed, reverse the plug in the wall. That was to change to make sure that the radio was at neutral potential instead of the hot side potential. That being said, um, I uh, took a look at all the internal wiring on the pictures of that, but uh, one of the things you got to be careful of is the wiring can get brittle, whether it's cloth, whether it's rubber, whether it's plastic, all of it can get hard and brittle. Um, and of course, if you have exposed wires, things can short out. Uh, maybe not immediately, but a little shake or a little move and the world ends. <clears throat> and this set was made around 1940 and probably post-war as well. I think I mentioned that this one has a tone control and the schematic for the 1940 radio does not. So it probably was a variation on the theme, although it's the same model number. So this set has a handful of rubber wires in there, but they're still very soft and pliable, so I didn't do anything with them. Uh, and so that's the wiring story. The next piece, of course, is replacing all of our favorite parts, capacitors. Do a little bit of a tutorial here on capacitors. So first off, uh, you know, capacitors block DC and conduct AC, and when they stop doing that is when we have a problem. So uh, they're uh, a paper, sandwich rolled up, kind of Tootsie Roll style, I suppose, uh, as paper and aluminum alternating. And the paper is what fails. The aluminum doesn't fail, the paper fails. And the paper has, I've been told, has acid in it from its processing, moisture in the air will activate the acid and you'll get pinholes. On the flip side, if it's been a very dry environment, it can become brittle and disintegrate. So very slowly you start getting a resistive connection between the uh, capacitor plates and sooner or later it shorts out. Uh, in the meantime, you might hear the audio get distorted or you might notice performance degrades because that, that uh, DC block you're trying to attain is now leaking over to the other circuit. So generally tubes are hooked plate to grid, plate to grid. So if you have this 90 volts on the plate and you're supposed to have zero or a minus voltage on the grid as an example, and you start getting a positive voltage on the grid, of the next tube, then the tube is biased wrong and it won't work properly. So that's kind of the overview of how those are made. Um, the interesting thing on this FADA is they had their own part numbers on their capacitors. If you look at this one right here, it says C-10.5. That's a part number, that's not a value. Uh, the good news is on the writers, if you look over here, this 0.05 is a 10.7 and this, uh, Electrolytic with a 20 dot something or other, 1038, and so on and so on. So I just circled a whole bunch of them. But there's also other part numbers in here, such as the ballast tube, which has their part number at no value, and the, uh, the uh, <coughs> pilot light or the dial light, uh, 
is their part number 120.17, but unless you know what's in there already, this doesn't help you any. So the good news, <coughs> pardon me, is at least the capacitors were marked. Um, there's no voltages on the capacitors, but we know we got 125 volts coming in on the worst case, so all the capacitors I used were 150 volts or bigger. Some of them I took out were 400 volts. Back in the day, they put 400 volt capacitors in because they would last a little longer because uh, the, the paper was a little bit more robust, but that was a, a Band-Aid. And, and as you all know, you know this, these things were dipped in wax to try and keep the moisture out and try and keep them all happy and working. But you know we're dealing with something 80 years old now and it's time to move on. So here's what got taken out. And uh, this one happens to be dual marked with the part number and the value. This one was probably replaced along the way or they used the commercial one. I can't tell you which way that was. And these two electrolytics were in there. They worked just fine. They were just monsters. And I, I and from a servicing the uh, chassis viewpoint, I wanted to get something that was a little easier to help troubleshoot the chassis. So here we go, before and after. Here's those two big electrolytics and all the wax capacitors. Here's the new electrolytics, which you can see are a whole lot smaller and replaced capacitors. That was, that was this exercise. The other things I did, obviously test the tubes. And as most of you know, a weak tube will still work just fine generally. Just wanna make sure you don't have ones that are on the verge of being completely shot or have some kind of leakage or if they're, if they're dead shorted, obviously the radio wouldn't work, but if they've got some leakage going, that's going to get worse. The other thing you want to do if you really want to be diligent is go around and test the DC voltages on the uh, tube sockets uh, just to see if everything's in range. And I'm using the word in range because if you notice on that schematic, there was no voltages listed on that schematic like there is maybe in a later SAMS or something like that. But if you get the tube manual out, uh, you can get a good idea of what's supposed to be on each pin. And, uh, and that'll expose resistors that are really out of whack, generally. Um, because again, this radio was working very robustly. So there's no thoughts that there's anything that, uh, that is going to give us a problem going forward. So there we are, short and sweet. Yeah, thanks Tom for that great presentation. And uh, we look forward to the next installment on this series of restoration presentations. And uh, so any other uh, questions for Tom on what he just covered? Hey, Tom. Yeah. It's Mike White. Um, you, did you do anything with any resistors on that chassis? Not a thing. Uh, did you check them or? Nope. Um, nope. nope. The, you know, the, the, some of those things can drift all over the place, but... Uh, you know, that radio worked so well, there was no, no thoughts that I'd have to go deal with. You know, when, even with the wax capacitors, it worked just fine. This was more of a, an exercise in longevity than it was in current performance. So, uh, yeah, so I didn't bother. Uh, certainly you could, but you know and I know and that, you know, you can be pretty out of range on a resistor on these sets and they'll still work because the quality of components back then was not what we expect today. I mean. If you could hold 20% on those capacitors or resistors, I mean, uh, you're probably in pretty good shape. So uh, yeah, no, I didn't. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions for Tom? If not, I'd like to thank the four presenters today for excellent presentations. A great uh, series of presentations today. I really enjoyed them all. And um, we, we need more for the future. So Matt's going to put up a poll here to see if you are interested in presenting at one of the upcoming meetings. And so please take some time to consider this and uh, let us know your intent. And we'll, uh, we'll be glad to have you present. And uh, so the next... Uh, Part of our agenda is the show and tell section and we, we put a poll out earlier and it didn't look like anyone was interested but that was before a lot of people joined so if anybody has a show and tell uh, now is the time to do it yeah this is charlie right I've, I've come up with something for you okay great 
why don't you share your uh, stuff with us? Share your. Okay, this is really off the cuff, so I usually practice all this stuff, so this may be, a, be very interesting, but we'll give it a try. Um, what I have here is a uh, demonstrator uh, DC generator. It's got a hand cranked uh, armature with a stack of five horseshoe magnets. I uh, got this at a Peoria ham fest some 30 some years ago. I'm presuming this was a demonstration unit for a college or a school. It's very, very nicely built, all solid brass hardware, a nice fancy wooden base. And I have hooked it up and it does work. Uh, I just thought it was a really cool item, even if it isn't the radio. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try to get a different view here so you can see, kind of see, the magnets are about a foot long. Uh, I guess I, I hope you can see that okay. Yeah, that's great. And my backdrop is an old uh, bathroom mat because I, I, I couldn't find anything else at the time. So it's a, a crudely put together presentation. Well, you know, that's that's what these show and tells are about. You know, just show <laughs> something that we might be interested in and you did. You, that's a very interesting. Yeah, I don't know if there's anyone has a question about it or not. It's, we try to get a closer view of the, is there a Charlie? Is there a brand name on it? No, there's not one name to be found on it. So it's very mysterious in that respect. I like I like the urn treatment of the uh, of the brass pieces. Uh, that's one of the things I like the best. Is that all the binding posts and and this is mounted in two brass. Uh, uh, holders that have adjustments so that it's very accurately, you know, it's little uh, cone-shaped bearings. I mean, you know, this was very meticulously constructed. It, it, it could be. It could be from the 1870s. I would guess it's quite old. Yeah, fascinating stuff. No, pla no plastic. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, thanks, Charlie. Um, that that fit very nicely in within the three minute uh, show and tell time. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Perfect. So, anyone else have a show and tell? If if not, I actually have a show and tell for today. If if uh, I can do this, I I uh, restored a chair side. And um, this is what it looked like. This is a 6S341. And uh, bought this a number of years ago. And the, it was pretty messed up. The, uh, the, the glass was shattered and the dial was all, the dial face was all busted up. So, uh, and then all the station caps were gone except for one. But uh, the rest of the radio was in pretty good shape. In fact, it was all there. And uh, so I stripped it. And uh, this is after the, uh, the stripping and uh, the first uh, coats of lacquer. It didn't use any stain. And then this is after the toning lacquer. And it's, it's just a beautiful radio. It's got this book matched veneer front. And uh, and then this is kind of the in-process uh, recapping of the radio. You can see that, you know, when I, when I looked at it, it looked like no one had really serviced the, the, the capacitors or anything. It had had the power cord replaced, but it was in good shape, uh, except for the, uh, 
the dial belt, which is a fabric thing, and it was frayed and coming apart. But uh, one, one thing I did is I replaced this dial belt with a polyurethane one from Quality Radio Belts. I never bought anything from them before, but I tell you that it, was, it fit perfectly, and because it's polyurethane, it's a little tacky, so it doesn't slip. So if you need a radio belt, I would recommend those guys. And then there's what it looks like with the chassis put in. And, uh, and I'm still waiting to get the, uh, the station caps that go over the, the adjusting screws. But it works great. And the amazing thing about it is all the tubes were good. And before I uh, took into restoring it electrically, I, you know, I brought it up and uh, it worked. With, with a slight hum, the filter caps were, were bad, but it it worked as a radio, so I didn't have to do much of an, a realignment or anything. So, the great thing. So, is your uh, dial face there? Is that a Radio Days reproduction or? No, no, it is not. Um, uh, I I put out a search on eBay for a chassis like that, and I found one for twenty five dollars, and I was able to take the parts I wanted and I donated the rest of it to the, uh, the Archie donation auction. So, but yeah, there, there it is behind me against the wall. You can see it back there. It fits really nicely in that little spot between the closet and the door. And uh, so I'm real pleased with it. That's my show and tell. You did a beautiful job on that cabinet, Tom. That's outstanding. Well, thank you, Greg. Yeah, I had, had a lot of fun with that. Yeah. yeah, that looks nice, Tom. And I do have a an update on the the tubes that we were talking about. Oh, sure, yeah. With the uh, with the shoulder, if you can see, trying to get the right uh, angle on them here. Get another light on. This one, uh, both both uh, screw terminals have a metal strap connecting them on this tube. So, and they've got, but each of these terminals has a wire going down into the tube base to something. I haven't checked it out electrically, but there's separate wires. And this other one, the Van Horn, that first one was a Sonatron. The Van Horn is similar. One of these connectors has a tube, has a wire going down into the tube. And then there's a jumper between the two. The other side is similar with a wire going into the tube and a jumper between the connectors. Now this one does say, uh, I, uh, minus B, minus B plus on the, those two. And the other one says minus C plus. So yeah, the, that's a power tube for the, for the, final or uh, last audio stage. And I think that's probably sa says on the paper label. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So that's not quite what I will, what my presentation showed is. <laughs> I need to go back and change that. So. But they're interesting tubes. So. Okay, thanks for following up on that, Dale. Um, if, if we don't have any other show and tells today, We'll move on to the next section, which is a brief update by Tom Kleinschmidt on our swap meet that we just had. And what about the future, Tom? Well, we, uh, we had our swap meet on Father's Day. Now, traditionally, we are with the Six Meter Club at the DuPage County Fairgrounds. The fairgrounds was not booking anything until August uh, at the time they talked to them because Illinois was still under a partial uh, COVID thing. Um, and so we did our own at uh, the American Legion Hall where we have our general meets. Uh, 
turnout was a little smaller than April and not a big surprise since it's a holiday and people had other things to do, but we had a nice turnout. Um, we uh, had a whole bunch of table radios that have been donated to the club and other people brought things as usual. And uh, we grossed about 520 some dollars out of the donation sale. And of course that's all used to offset the operating costs of the business. So uh, uh, that worked out pretty well. Uh, as a sidebar, for those of you who are members and get printed copies of the uh, newsletter, uh, we changed which post office we sent it from. Last time we sent one out for April, it took forever for people to get some of them. I've so far gotten no comments from anybody that said they didn't get their newsletter. So if you did not get it, or if you got it much quicker, uh, you know, drop me a note. I, I, we want to make sure that that change was actually what made the change, what made it better. Um, so going forward, August, we don't have booked yet, but we will have shortly. We will not have Radio Fest, even though Illinois is in phase five, meaning there's no restrictions. At the time, we had to start locking in everything for Radio Fest, which is April. That was not the case. So we will have a local meet. We haven't got the details sorted out, but I expect that we'll be booking that along with uh, the October meet and the December meet and get kind of back onto a regular schedule as far as swap meets go. So that's the short version of the swap meet world. And by the way, uh, you guys in Wisconsin, you guys have one coming up on the what? They all unmute. July 11th, I think. July, July 11th. And, and you're going to be at a different venue this time, right? It'll be in the uh, New Berlin. I'm looking for the flyer here. New Berlin okay. Halo House. If you get a second, just pop it into the uh, into the uh, the chat thing. Yeah, July 11th, the New Berlin Ale House. Uh, I'll put the uh, I'll put the address into the. Uh, Give a chat. You can tell it's Wisconsin. We're going to an ale house. <laughs> Outdoors. Well, there's hey. one in August in Madison, too, I think, on your list. August 22nd, yeah. August 22nd <laughs> is Madison. September 12th is back in New Berlin. And uh, October 10th is in Milwaukee at the terminal, Joel Hauser's uh, facility. Down by the airport. Yeah. That's not too, not too far away from Northern Illinois. So if you club members are up there, you might consider going up there. <clears throat> so thanks for that update, Tom. And we'll look forward to seeing when the August date for the swap meet uh, ends up being. So that really concludes the main portion of our video meeting today. It's been a great meeting. We had a lot of great presentations and show and tells and good exchange of ideas and information about things. So we will now um, end this portion and move on to the items wanted, items for sale.